We live in a funny era. I no longer know how to have certain conversations about like hot topics in the media. And the last three weeks have been really interesting because when people talk about cancel culture, they're almost never actually talking about cancel culture. Cancel culture, as I understand it and have experienced it, is a corporate unwillingness to platform artists, creators, or other public personalities who have been embroiled in scandals online that are usually extra legal. These scandals lead to a cancellation, which involves basically the targeted mass harassment of these people, generally people or ideas or companies based on anecdotal or anonymous evidence or strong evidence. But regardless, these are things in their personal lives that lead them to be deplatformed. You, you know, you can't really cancel a fictional thing because a fictional thing, you basically just stop making it. So when people talk about cancel culture though, you're dealing with three very different definitions of cancel culture. And you never know because of the way the internet works, you never know if you're talking to a stranger or even your friends, you never know what definitions they're using for anything. The internet exploded our ideas about how other people view the world. Because like I grew up in LA in the 90s and to me, I was Jewish and I thought, you know, when I was a little kid, I thought maybe half of the world is Jewish. No, we're one of the, this tiny minority, you know? And I thought, you know, maybe everyone in the world, you know, knows gay people, likes gay people, likes black people. Everyone likes each other pretty much, you know, other than when there's the LA riots, you know, when I was a little kid, there were like gay and black people on TV and it didn't really matter. Blade was the most important superhero to me when I was a little kid. So him being black, it didn't really figure in. However, as we moved forward definitionally, especially, especially after 9-11, a lot of things were exposed about the way other people view the world. When you watch people like Drew Gooden and Danny Gonzalez and Cody Ko, one of the things that's so wild about them is that they interact with TikToks and you know, so viral social media things and they cyber bully people who are cringe and who are weird. But one of the things you always hear people like Cody Ko saying or Danny Gonzalez saying is, who does this? Who would ever do this? Well, the answer is people from outside your bubble. It, your view of the world is completely elastic to the context you're experiencing. And the internet likes to pretend that isn't true. Tyranny is the death of nuance is the famous quote. So I wanted to talk about sort of where I'm at in my conception of all of these things briefly. And I wanted to know if anyone agrees with me. Uh, Cause it's kind of, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I agree with me. So this is me demoing out how I feel about the recent blurred definition of cancel culture as it applies to things that are immediately in pop culture and will probably be irrelevant a week from now. Everything I'm saying won't matter, but maybe the idea behind it does. So here's the idea behind it. Here's what I'm fumblingly trying to articulate. They made it so Mr. Potato Head is non-binary and Republicans were upset. It's a potato. Mr. Potato Head is the original non-binary gender icon. He's the original trans icon. You know how much it takes to make Mr. Potato Head into Mrs. Potato Head? It goes like this. Bonk, bonk. There, it's a woman now. If there's ever been a more fucking poignant illustration of the elasticity of the concept of gender, it's the removable gender of Mr. Potato Head. Who gives a fuck? Also, Mr. Potato Head? When's the last time you were like, I gotta get my kid a Mr. Potato Head or a potato? It's like, he's a character in Toy Story. He might as well be an Etch-a-Sketch. Like it, the, the character in Toy Story, those versions still exist. I... Okay, so clearly being upset about gender switching Mr. Potato Head is silly. It's a thing to get upset about because you're upset about it, right? It doesn't mean anything about our culture. Then you come to the Dr. Seuss books, which are racist, which Dr. Seuss himself wouldn't have wanted out there these days. Like, and you can pretty much say that because you know Dr. Seuss wasn't a fucking 
racist in that way. He was just it, culturally these things were okay, and it was the books weren't canceled. They were Doctor Seuss books that I've never fucking heard of. People always like I saw Fox putting up like covers of like the Lorax and all the places you'll go. These books are not fucking canceled. The publisher, the actual people who publish them, chose to withdraw them. Because they're racist, and they don't want little kids seeing ugly racist images. Again, fine. Song of the South being banned. Song of the South isn't an outright racist movie, Disney's Song of the South. But at the end of the day, it features stereotypes that are pretty fucking racist. So I don't have a problem with it, right? I understand why that movie isn't fronted by Disney+. Plus. But then you come to Pepe Le Pew. Right? The, the treatment of Pepe Le Pew in the bizarre ongoing saga of the sequel to Space Jam. Okay, so th this one really, it fucks with me because I saw people being upset about it in a way that I'm not. People were upset because they were like, he's just a skunk. Oh, we're canceling Pepe Le Pew now? And it, they were upset about it from the same... T standpoint as they were getting mad about you can't cancel dr seuss no one did you can't cancel mr potato head no one did but they did cancel pepe Le Pew, and i wanted to talk about how that happened because it's so ugly and weird and bizarre so for years the common discourse in pop culture around pepe Le Pew is that he's a creep right this however did not stop him from being featured not behaving like a creep in most recent iterations of the Looney Tunes on TV and in the original Space Jam where he's not a creep. And that's making Pepe Le Pew still funny but not a creep is incredibly easy. I did it for Warner Brothers. I wrote a Pepe Le Pew movie for them. That got killed by Space Jam because they were like, that's what we're doing with the Warner Brothers. At the time, I was going to do... I was pitching them a trilogy of movies that were like a Looney Tunes Marvel Universe, basically, where you do a Pepe Le Pew heist thriller, script and description, and then you do uh, then you do Porky Pig and Bugs Bunny driving across Tasmania, and you do Mad Max Fury Road, but as a cartoon with the Looney Tunes. Can you imagine the fucking action in this movie? And then the last one you do is like a giant space opera dune scale comedy about Marvin the Martian and Daffy Duck. It writes itself. I don't know why you'd want to make another fucking Looney Tunes basketball movie. I'm, I'm getting distracted. My point is that Pepe Le Pew culturally is creepy, right? Except for in execution, he almost never is. In execution, Pepe Le Pew is a stinky skunk who thinks he's a ladies' man who falls in love with a cat who can't talk. The cat thinks Pepe Le Pew is a skunk and reacts to him like he's a human. The jokes in Pepe Le Pew, the cartoons, are not at the expense of the cat. The cat is portrayed like a cat, not even like a human woman. The way she reacts when Pepe grabs her and tries to kiss her is not like a human would. It's like, when you, you know when you pick up a cat and you're like trying to pick up the cat and kiss it and it's trying to get away? That's Pepe Le Pew cartoons. And in them, Pepe is always getting smashed and bashed and crushed and killed. Pepe Le Pew cartoons are not actually creepy. They're not. It's the idea and the elements of them separated from context. There are elements that have not aged well in them. I will immediately acknowledge that. But Pepe's in the first Space Jam, and it's fine. What Warner Brothers did was make a scene about consent in a Pepe, in a Warner Brothers Looney Tunes. Why are you doing this? Like, it's their choice to do that to him. They made the creative do that to him. It's not a real person. He's not a real person. You don't have, he can just be a funny skunk. You chose, they chose to put him in this situation and then they chose to cut it and they chose to identify him 
as a symbol of the patriarchy and misogyny and rape culture. And that's in his fucking Wikipedia now. He didn't, Mel Blanc and the original Looney Tunes cartoons and the Tiny Tunes in the 90s and the new Looney Tunes shows in the 2000s, none of them made Peppy about what's creepy about Peppy. In the same way that, you know, if you were making a Batman movie, you wouldn't focus on the fact that he kidnapped a little kid and brainwashed him into being a child soldier. And that if Batman broke someone's arm, there's no insurance for that. So these low level thugs who Batman hurts, actually that's life ruining. Let's go home with them and watch them spiral into debt. Batman is a white cis male who's a member of the 1%. None of this needs to be The types of stories we tell now more than ever cannot be shaped entirely by the types of stories we are afraid of. We cannot spend all of our time backpedaling and rejiggering and scraping around and then arguing, passionately arguing the, the finer points of the in moral integrity of a cartoon skunk and I'm doing it now myself, but I hope you know this is not about Pepe Le Pew. This is a disgust. I use the term glass planet. Glass planet is how I describe a creative idea. Because when you first have a creative idea, it's a glass planet. And all there's a shape, but all the rules are up to you to determine. They made the choice. Instead of having Peppy, if they wanted to acknowledge it, instead, if they want to have the skunk in the movie, they made the choice to contextualize him this way. Instead of being like, he settled down, or the, have the cat be like, we had a will they, won't they for a while, but, you know, we figured it out. Or they're in couples therapy. Or Peppy's in therapy now, and he's like, I have sworn off love. It turns out I was behaving a little bit uh, toxic. And then have Bugs go, it was the era, Peppy. You know, something like that. Just like, make him a joke. He's a joke. You made him into something else. You made him into a weapon against an idea that you created. And that to me is insane. If you're holding the pen, you cannot judge the character. And you certainly shouldn't be trying to score points by destroying a character that's been around for 70 years by finally crystallizing and forcing the issue of whether this character is creepy or not. Well, now he is, but not because he was, because you did it. You are the people who pulled the trigger. At the end of several Peppy the Pew cartoons, his smell goes away and then the cat chases him around and he fights with the cat and tries to get away. That's Peppy Le Pew. It's a romantic push-pull that is a joke about a skunk and a cat. Yeah, can you transpose other things onto it? Of course. Did you transpose something onto it that effectively ruins it forever? Yeah, you did. And for no reason other than your own weird choice.